Welcome back to the Ecclesia Project. I am a freedman of God as your host on this journey to discover the lost Ecclesia of God. Okay, this is episode 58. And in the last episode, we uh, started uh, chapter 9 of 1 Corinthians. We only got to the first two verses. Uh, so, uh, and, and, we, and we, we, we slowed down in our analysis because we wanted to focus on the idea that uh, Paul uh, presenting himself as an apostle and not necessarily trying to prove that he's one of the 12, but but showing that there were apostles other than uh, the 12. And there were, and there's references in scriptures of Barnabas, of Silas, of James, the brother of Jesus being apostles. Um, and, and and just the idea that there there were false apostles that needed to be tested and found out, all of that it, it implies strongly that there were that there were there did exist true apostles. Uh, they were not one of the twelve. Okay, so uh, that's why it was an issue. It was something that needed to be decided, to be determined, to be tested, as in Revelation two, uh, where Jesus commends the ecclesia in Ephesus on a good job in testing uh, those claiming to be a, a, an apostle and fi finding them to be false. So there were a lot of false apostles running around um, that are claimed to be sent by Jesus, sent sent to uh, spread the gospel, spread the, the, the good news of the kingdom of heaven. Uh, and they had their own version, of course, um, not, not, not quite the same as, as those that were proclaimed by the apostles and that was the main tip off because we talked about how the miracles of you know of healing and 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 casting out spirits could be faked i mean that, that i i you, it's not much of a claim of, of a false apostle if if uh, they didn't try to prove themselves by a fake miracle okay so i'm sure they were faked many times and um uh, so, so that that was all uh, part of the game, and they they had to make those determinations. Uh, and what was uh, Paul's main criteria? What did he rely on primarily to to demonstrate and prove without a, without a shadow of a doubt that he was a true apostle of Christ? What was not his miracles, which he did quite quite a few, uh, did a lot of healings, did a lot of. Uh, wonders and miracles and and whatnot. We we've seen he did you know in Ephesus they would just um, take, try to take the, the uh, his handkerchief or or what do you call it? the the headband right around him and just take that and and heal people with the headband with the with Paul's sweat on it as he was working as a leather worker. Um, so th this is the kind of power that that Jesus expressed through Paul to identify Paul as a true apostle. Um, but yet he didn't rely on that. He didn't rely on any of those things. Um, and, 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 you know, even, even to the point where he, he laid on, remember he laid on that, uh, that person that fell from the, uh, from, I don't know what story it was, but he fell from the window and, and looked like he was dead. And Paul laid on top of him and boom, he was, he just got right up. Uh, did did he raise the dead? Did Paul raise the dead at that point? Maybe. So, th this all of these things that that occurred in his life, Paul didn't talk about any of that when he, when he discussed his uh, credentials and and what the proof of his cr credentials. He didn't go on and on about the visions he had, the the fact that Christ appeared to him, that he was caught up in the third heaven. He didn't he didn't talk about that when when he said, okay, you know, let me. Let me demonstrate that I am truly an apostle. He basically said, "No, no, no. Look at you. Look, look at yourselves. Look at your gathering. Look at what you've become. Look at what happened to you as you embraced uh, my message, the message that I brought to you. Okay, what happened? You know, and that was his main argument. That that you experienced this. You know, you know." that you were all called as members of the body of Christ, that you all came together at, to make a uh, full body of Christ, that you were uh, inaugurated as a whole, as a new, new covenant temple of God, as, as a designated people of God. Uh, and 
all the things, and you were given gifts um, from the Spirit, and the Spirit dwells among you in your gathering, as you can tell through your gatherings and, and the prophecies and the tongues and the interpretations and the miracles and the healings that go on in your gathering. All of that, or the kingdom of God draws near. And we talked about how, how that phrase of the kingdom of God draws near is always related to miracles, healing of the sick, casting out of demons. Um, these things were happening in the Ecclesia of Corinth. So he says, you want proof that I'm an apostle? You, I came and brought you this message, and this was completely, you, you had not been exposed to this before. Uh, th this was uncharted territory. I came, I brought this message, you embraced it, and look what happened. Exa exactly how I explained it would. This is how the new covenant works. You know I understand the new covenant because you're, you're an example. You are, he calls, it, he calls them the seal of his apostleship. The guarantee that I am an apostle, because look at, look at the fruit of my message, of my ministry. Look at what has happened. So that was his main argument. That's what he relied on the most to establish his credibility. Uh, and, and that is something that you can't fake, especially when they were the ones witnessing it. They experienced it. It was, you know, uh, right in front of their eyes. So, um, so we talked about that, about uh, that th that the fact that he relied on that as the one of the, his main uh, uh, proof of his credentials is 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 extraordinary, right? That he didn't go into uh, all the the boasting about all the things that he could have talked about, okay? But um, so we we talked about all that, uh, and and then. Oh, you know, now we're ready to go and tackle verse three, okay? Uh, and we t and, and we we uh, also discussed in the last episode the fact that when he says, "My defense to those who examine me is this," what what defense is he talking about? What would they examine him about? It's not about his his apostleship, okay? Uh, you know, he says, if to others I'm not an apostle, at least I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. He's talking to these people. He's talking to the ecclesia in Corinth. He's talking to people in this ecclesia that might examine him. And what would they examine him about? Not, not about his apostleship. They know that. They understand that. They might examine him and, 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 ha and have some doubt as to his statement in chapter 13. Oh, okay. Let me share the screen. I, uh, yeah. Sorry. Um, so we're in, in, in. Did I say chapter? I'm sorry. In verse 13 in chapter eight, the 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 verse right before the beginning of chapter nine, where he says, "Therefore, if food causes my brother to stumble, I will never eat meat again, so that I will not." cause my brother to stumble. So that's a bold statement. We talked about that last last episode. That's a very bold statement. And people might say, yeah, you know, uh, easy for you to say, Paul, you don't live here. You, you don't have to make these sacrifices. And, and they might doubt the sincerity and authenticity of that statement. Um, especially those that were complaining to Paul that were asking him basically to set the Gentiles straight. And, and to and to get them off his, their back when, when it comes to eating in the uh, temp, in the idol's temple. So, um, so this is a bold statement, and 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 uh, and and so he's kind of setting it up in verses one and two. Okay, he's kind of. I, I know you're going to think that's bold, but let, let's first of all establish some facts. Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Okay, so we went through that. The idea that he's an apostle. He put that issue to bed in in his arguments. Uh, are you not my work? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? We talked about what that meant. Are you not my work in the Lord? We talked about what that meant. And if to others that might not think I'm an apostle, you know I'm an apostle. That's kind of parenthetical, uh, saying. Uh, so let's 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 okay. That's that's the facts. We set the facts straight. These are the facts. Now, now let me talk about defending what i just sta stated in verse 13 in chapter 8 okay let, let me my defense to those who might examine me is this 
Okay. Now you know I'm free. I have I have a uh, uh, I am an apostle. So don't I have a right to eat and drink? Okay. In other words, that we talked, we looked at at, at the, when when Jesus sent the twelve. When we looked at when Jesus sent the seventy, both of them, whether you're of the twelve or the seventy, both of them had the right to eat and drink as they visited the cities. In other words, they had the right to room and board, free room and board. That's what Jesus told them. Okay, as you travel. And, and Paul was definitely traveling. He's an itinerant evangelist, itinerant apostle, teacher, pastor, right? He was all those things. So um, he was itinerant. So he's in the same position as though, at least as those in the 70, if not those in the 12. He's in the same position as they are, as they were when Jesus sent them out, okay? And so he says, "Well, don't I have that right? You know, uh, don't don't I was sent out by Christ? You know this, so don't don't I have that right for free room and board? Okay. And so you would think that's all he had to say, isn't it a no brainer? You know, but typical in Paul's the way Paul thinks and analyzes and 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 flushes out almost every argument you can imagine." Uh, Paul goes into this long argument to establish his right to eat and drink. Okay, he doesn't just rely, I mean, he will later, but he doesn't just rely on the instructions of Jesus. All right, so he starts to embellish, he starts to flesh it out, right? So he says, do, do we not have a right to free room and board? All right. Do we not have a right to take along a believing wife, okay, even as the rest of the apostles? And 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 he says the rest of the apostles. Now, I there, there's some that put in the word and. Uh, the, the, the Greek is chi. The Greek word is chi. But um, you, and of course, the, the typical translation is the word and as a conjunction, right? Um, there are other options with Kai that you can choose. The reason why that doesn't make any sense to me to put the word and in there uh, is that, uh, first of all, he talked about the brothers of the Lord, that's fine, um, and Cephas, okay? Um, so when you say and the brothers of the Lord, now we know that one of the, one of the brothers of the Lord, James, was already designated as an apostle. So we said when it says even as the rest of the apostles and the brother brothers of the Lord, what do you mean? You're saying that the this the brothers of the Lord is not an apostle? It's distinct from this group of apostles? Well, that's not consistent with that passage we looked at in the last episode as far as one of the brothers of the Lord James who was considered an apostle. So that he's included as an apostle, right? Um, and Cephas, we definitely is one of the 12. So to put the word and in there didn't make sense to me. I, I think the better word that another option you can use is namely and uh, or or the maybe the word even uh, might be a, a word also that you might want to use. But it's it's basically the idea that, you know, specifically uh, that we're talking about the brothers of the Lord and Cephas, who I know visited Corinth is is I believe is what Paul's saying there. I know I know Cephas went and visited Corinth. I know there were some uh, brothers of the Lord that went and visited Corinth. I know they have wives. I know they have uh, you know that they, they, they were given free room and board. I already know this. So um, why why wouldn't we be afforded the same right, J just as they 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 received? Okay, and of course they received this this after Paul had come and gone. Well, maybe not even gone, but after he had, he initially came. Uh, for all I know, maybe maybe Peter did visit while Paul was still there, because Paul was there, uh, you know, kind of long. It was at least a year and a half. So, in any event, um, the point that 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 Paul's trying to make you you gave them free room and board, right? 
Now, weren't we entitled to the same thing? Okay, so, um, and, and all he's doing is just trying to establish the fact that they were entitled to free room and board. That, that's all he's try, trying to do. He's not trying to scold them or anything. He's just saying, you know, don't, don't we have that right? Didn't we have that right for re, a free room and board when we came? Okay, and, and to take along a, a believing wife? Um, or do only Barnabas and I not have a right to refrain from working? Now, I don't know any, what the deal is with Barnabas because Paul didn't come to Corinth with Barnabas. So I don't know uh, whether Barnabas you know, came later or, or how that worked out. But for some reason, uh, apparently Barnabas took on the ethic of Paul that when they traveled as itinerant evangelists and apostles, because uh, Barnabas was considered an apostle also, as we saw in, in the in the last episode, um, that they would not take free room and board. They they just would refuse it, okay? And they would work uh, to support themselves, all right? Um, so he's saying, look, Barnabas and I have taken on this, this approach to our ministry that we're not we're going to refuse the free room and board because believe me, I'm sure there was a lot of people that offered Paul free room and board. Um, and, and he, and he's just saying, you know, I had a right to it. I had a right to accept that, you know, in my position. And, uh, and, you know, just like, just as these people did. Um, but I didn't. Okay. And Barnabas didn't either. All right. Um, but they, he, what the, the claim, I guess what the point he's trying to make is, I didn't accept it, but not because I didn't have a right to it. I wasn't, uh, I wasn't refusing free room and board because I didn't feel I had a right to free room and board. That wasn't the reason. Okay. He's starting to get them to, oh, okay, well, then they're, start, they're starting to think, well, what was the reason? You know, so he's just trying to get them, you know, to, you know, jog their mind a little bit. If they're, if they're, if they're thinking that uh, that 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 Paul would not, you know, it, that Paul would not live up to his statement in verse thirteen in chapter eight, that that Paul uh, is just is just boasting a little empty boast there. Um, he's saying, really, you you think maybe uh, you're thinking you're trying to test me and trying to think, well, you know, you're not buying that. Well, let's look at what I've already done. Is is what he's doing? Okay, let's look at you. You want to, you know, question that? Well, here's my defense to that. Look at what I've already done. I d didn't I have a right to free room and board? Okay, I'm an apostle. Okay, um, and and did I take it? You know, so he's getting them to start to think about it. Um, and then in chapter in, in verse seven, he says, "Who at any time serves as a soldier at his own expense?" Now. Someone might think, well, all right, I don't, okay, fine. Yeah, I guess a soldier goes out, fights for his country. The country's going to pay uh, for his room and board and expense and, and equipment and, you know, everything that he needs uh, as he's sacrificing for his country, right? Um, so why does he bring that up? Uh, who plants a vineyard and does not eat the fruit of it? Or who tends a flock and does not use the milk of the flock? You know, I, I it, it, when I, you know, first, uh, I, I read this passage many times, you know, um, in my life, it never occurred to me to really think about what he's saying here, okay? Um, because I just thought he was just giving examples of people that were, you know, working on a project or working on something. and and they were given free room and board as they were working on it. They were they were kind of sacrificing uh, for a cause or for a, a, you know a, a goal or something like that. And and they were they were given this you know this right to to these things. So, but the more you know when I think about it, when you think about it, all of these examples are exactly what he was doing. Okay, when when we talks about the idea of a soldier. Okay, this is what Paul was doing as a soldier of Christ going into Corinth. 
okay? He, he was going on, behind enemy lines, uncharted territory, okay, to conquer and to, and to, and to try to plant a kingdom of God behind enemy lines, you see, an oasis. Uh, we've talked about that. So he was going into battle, all right? And, um, and so th this idea of, of a soldier, actually, you know, it's, it's exactly what he, what he did in his, at first. I mean, when, when he first went into Corinth, he was a soldier for Christ. And, and I just, I, I went to Acts uh, 18 and just to kind of get an idea, give, give an idea of, of this account that was, you know, that Luke wrote down in Acts um, about what happened in Corinth. He's, he's in Corinth. He goes into Corinth. Okay. After these things, he left Athens, went to Corinth. Okay. And so it talks about some stuff. And he talked. He he talked in the synagogue, uh, and Silas and Timothy came came, so he was able to devote his his time full time to to his teaching because apparently Silas and Timothy uh, began working to support the team. Okay, that was kind of their what they needed to contribute so that to free Paul up to go after this full time, and so because uh, they worked as a team. All right, so. Um, so he, he starts talking to the synagogue and, and of course the Jews are getting angry, uh, but others are responding and made, and, and this, you know, Crispus, the leader of the synagogue believed in the Lord. So there's one leader. Um, so it's starting, you know, and, and of course, when these things start to happen, when there's results that occur and there's, and there's people that are attracted uh, guess what? The people in charge, the people in power get a little angry, right? They get a little jealous. Um, and 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 they're going to start to resist. Uh, and they're going to start to, uh, you know, maybe do some naughty things, right? Um, so while he was there, it, it says here in verse 12, but while, uh, uh, what is it, Gallio? Uh, was pro council of Achaia, um, or Achaia, maybe is a better Achaia. I, I think some people say Achaia, but I, I think it's Achaia is, is a better uh, pronunciation. The AI should be an I, uh, Achaia. Um, but while uh, Gallo, uh, Gallio, wait, what is, uh, sometimes I have a hard time. Gallio was pro council, pro, pro consul. Of Achaia, the Jews with one accord rose up against Paul and brought him before the judgment seat. Now I think they had to do that because uh, uh, Paul was a Roman citizen, so they they couldn't just start wailing on him. Uh, they'd get in big trouble because he was a Roman citizen. So uh, they but but they wanted to they wanted to get at him. They wanted to punish this guy. Um, so they did bring him in before a Roman uh, ruler, a Roman judge, and they said. Hey, we want this man persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. Not a great argument. Uh, they weren't really thinking very well on this, uh, you know, uh, to make that argument in front of a Roman judge. I don't know why you would make that argument. It, it sounds a little silly, um, but that's I guess that's all they could come up with. Uh, uh, persuades men to worship God contrary to law. But when Paul was about to open his mouth. Gallio uh, tells the Jews, if it were a matter of wrong or vicious crime, oh Jews, I, I would, it would be reasonable for me to put up with you. But if there's just questions about words and names and your own law, look after it yourselves. I mean, I, I don't know who wrote their brief, uh, these Jews, because that's, that you would expect an automatic denial, you know, uh, you know, um, that argument is just terrible. Why? Why would a Roman judge care about that? They're not. You have to make a better argument than that. But you know, whatever. Um, and then, so, so I because I am unwilling to be a judge of these matters. Obviously, okay. And he and he drove them away from the judgment seat. So they're frustrated. Um, 
and and uh, they they want to get somebody. They they want to fight some. They want to they want some blood. So they they all took hold of this Sosthenes, the leader of the synagogue, who apparently was sympathetic with Paul and his message, and began beating him in front of this judgment seat. Probably Sosthenes was not a Roman citizen, so they could do what they want with him. And uh, but but Gallio was not concerned about any of these things. He just you know, whatever. These Jews, you know, who can deal with these guys? Um, so, so this this I'm sure uh, upset Paul because he's watching Sosthenes, someone that's sympathetic, someone that he that I'm sure he loves as a brother, um, get beaten right in front of him, and and that could not. I mean, it's almost like we're going to beat Sosthenes just to get at you, Paul, because we can't beat you. And so we're going to beat your friend here. That's kind of what was going on, which is like, how wicked can you get? That is so sick, right? But this is what the Jews, this is how evil they were. This is why they had an evil conscience. And they probably thought that they were doing it for God, right? Isn't that what Jesus said, that they're going to persecute you in the name of God? They're going to persecute the children of God in the name of God. You see, this this is what evil conscience, this is what an evil conscience does. It calls good evil, it calls evil good. And it's just a a a really it, you know, it, it's it's so like shocking to watch and see right before your eyes. But it it happened and there it was and Paul was looking at it and he and I'm sure he felt like throwing up. It, it this was not fun. Okay, but this is what it this is what it is to be a soldier for Christ, you know, and this is what Paul did, and 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 this is just one account, and I'm sure there were many things that happened that were similar to this, that would uh, would he would get he would he he would be under he he would be in all kinds of trouble. Okay, he would be in all kinds of trouble. And people would be, uh, uh, you know, just just can't wait to get their hands on this guy. And the, and, the, and the only thing that really saved Paul in many instances was the fact that he was a Roman citizen. All right. And, and when people knew that, they had to back off. They couldn't just go nuts like they wanted to. Okay. So, um, so that, that worked out really well for Paul. In that respect, he was a lot. He was able to be much more bold. Okay, um, so anyway, th this is this is what happened, and I'm sure there was a lot more that did happen, and and a lot more threats, a lot more uh, things that were going on behind the scenes. And this is what I believe. You know, this is when when Paul says, "What soldier uh, goes ahead and." Um, and, and serves at his own expense. So he's basically saying, you know, he's describing himself. He's describing what he was doing, all right? Um, and then he says, who plants a vineyard and does not eat the fruit of it? Okay, again, this is exactly what Paul was doing, right? He was planting a vineyard in Corinth, okay? And, and we talked a lot about Matthew 21, in the last episode, so I'm not going to go through all that again. Um, I, I I do want to just quickly go to um, um. Okay, I thought I let let me let me go here just to kind of remind you. This was in a prior episode. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was. Um, but it, it, it just reminds you of, of this whole idea of a vineyard and, how, and what it meant and, and, and the symbolism here, uh, you know, uh, this is in, uh, Psalm 80, uh, you removed a vine from Egypt. Well, what did he, what did God remove from Egypt? He removed the Israelites, right? The a designated people of God. That's what he removed from Egypt. And he drove out the nations and planted it. So he plants this vine, this designated people of God, uh, in the, in this ground that he cleared. 
uh, he got rid of the 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 uh, the rocks and and things like that, um, and and planted this people of God in Canaan. Okay, and it took deep root and filled the land. So and it became a vineyard. Okay, and the mountains were covered with its shadow, uh, the cedars of God with its bows. It was just uh, you know. It, it, it grew large. We, we know how large uh, um, the, the kingdom of Israel grew, especially under Solomon. It grew very large. Uh, it was sending out its branches to the sea. It, it grew all the way to the sea and it shoots to the river, to the Jordan River, right? So um, it, it grew significantly and, and the people got settled in Canaan and grew into a kingdom, right? And now... He says, why have you broken down its hedges? Okay, so there was a protection that God put around the kingdom of Israel uh, that were, the nations could not break through. They were constantly getting defeated. And that, you know, it wasn't working out well for them. Uh, that was like the hedge of God, like, like the hedge that he put around Job. Uh, th this is the hedge of God, but now the, the hedge... Uh, the hedge is starting to weaken, okay? And and we all know why, but uh, so that all who pass this way starts picking its fruit, okay? Um, and a boar from the forest eats it away. So they, they start to lose battles. They start to lose, you know, Jews and Israelites in these battles. Uh, whatever moves in the field feeds on it. And, and it starts to deteriorate. That the kingdom of Israel began to deteriorate, as we know. It, it reached a zenith under Solomon, and it starts to deteriorate. O God of hosts, turn again now, we beseech you. Who, who uh, This was uh, a psalm of Asaph, and I don't know who Asaph is, but anyway. Um, um, it was sending out branches and shoots. Why have you brought... Okay, a boar... Okay, whatever... O God of hosts, turn again now, we beseech you, look down from heaven and see, take care of this vine. So he's basically saying, please preserve this people of God. Please preserve this people, right? Um, even the shoot which your right hand has planted. And that's like this, this particular shoot, meaning the Son of God, that, that, this, that was established in this Davidic covenant, okay? So uh, you have a Davidic covenant that established this... Uh, this 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 promise that that the 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 uh, offspring of David would forever rule in the throne. Okay, that's you know the Davidic covenant. I think it's I think it's First Samuel seven or Second Samuel seven. One of those things. Um, but anyway, so he says, look, this shoot which your right hand has planted and on the son whom you have strengthened for yourself. So you you have this covenant with this people that this, this uh, uh, offspring of David is going to rule forever. Remember that, God. You got you to hold to that. It is burned with fire. It is cut down. You know, it, that covenant can be broken because we're, we may get extinct here in a, in a little bit. They perish at the rebuke of your con continence. Let your hand be upon the man of your right hand, upon the son of man whom you made strong for yourself. In other words, please under remember your promise. You can't, you can't let us go. You can't let us be extinguished. You, you have to hold us up. Remember that, God, and, 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 and please deliver us. Uh, and and put your hand on on that king of, of uh, that descendant of David, that's king of Israel, and and strengthen him, okay, uh, so that we will not turn back from you. Revive us. We will call upon your name, O Lord God of hosts. Restore us. Cause your face to shine upon us, and we will be saved. So, um, the main thing I wanted you to to understand is, you have this vine, which is people of God, right? So this vine that that is spreads into this vineyard and and it fills the boundaries and and all of that that that's similar to to Matthew 21 we talked about that where he he plants this vineyard he he uh he he surrounds it he puts a wall around it he puts a builds a tower puts a wine vat 
he does he does all these things and we and we discussed all those symbols uh on the last episode um it, you know uh let me see let me just go to one more uh, isaiah 5 isaiah was a prophet um on in in uh under in, in the divided kingdom i did i not do that okay i didn't something happened here i didn't do it right all right that's what I meant to do. Okay, so I've, Isaiah five, um, Isaiah was a prophet that 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 pr primarily was in Judah, and uh, and and he he was I think was a I forget the king the the father of Hezekiah I forget he was, a, he was an evil king Ahaz or something like that, but anyway, um, he was in that time period with Hezekiah and his father, and so. And, and with others, I think. Uh, but he was like a pretty famous prophet, as you know. So he, he, this is the parable of the vineyard. Let me sing now for my well-beloved, uh, a song for my beloved concerning his vineyard. My well-beloved had a vineyard on a fertile hill. Okay. So the vineyard is the kingdom of Israel. Okay. In this, in this case, it was really a divided kingdom. I'm not to be honest. I'm not even sure whether the northern kingdom had already been taken by Assyria or not. I, I don't know uh, at the timing of this, but it seemed to be that. And this fertile hill was like uh, the Jerusalem was on a hill, and 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 that was like the kind of the center of the vineyard, and and then the vineyard spread out. Uh, so he dug it all around, removed its stones, planted it with the choicest vine. And we talked about that vine that he brought out from Egypt to plant the vineyard, okay? Uh, he built a tower in the middle of it. This is just like Matthew 21. We talked about the tower, what it meant. He hewed out a wine vat. Um, so we talked about what that was in the last episode. Um, he expected it to produce good grapes, but it only produced worthless ones. See, and, and this is... This is kind of the, the 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 point is that he does a lot of work to set up these vineyards and to set up an ecclesia of God. There's a lot of work done. Okay, you have to understand that uh, that when you're setting up a kingdom of God, uh, you know, in in the old covenant it was a shadow. We we discussed that many times, and in the new covenant it's an image. But you're setting up a, a kingdom of God on earth behind him enemy lines there's a lot of work that's doing that look look at all the work i mean he, he has a vineyard on a fertile hill uh, and that that kind of is, is a reference to the city on a hill un, under the new covenant that's how it translates um but and, and he dug dug it all around uh and removed its stones so he he cleared it of all the the trash he just like you know, in the wheat field, you you have to prepare the field for the to to plant the wheat, right? You have to prepare the ground before you 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 plant the wheat, and and that takes a lot of preparation, and that's preparing the hearts. You're preparing the hearts of the members that are going to be called. Okay, you're preparing the hearts of the members of the of the kingdom of God. Uh, I'm sorry, the members of the body of Christ. Okay, you're, you're, you're preparing the members of the body of Christ to be called together, to, to, to uh, be one full body of Christ, to constitute one full body of Christ, right? Uh, in, in this ecclesia of God, which is an image of the kingdom of God. So there's a lot of work that is done in, in, uh, in putting these, these things together. And then he... Um, he built a tower in the middle of it. You're going to have a core. And what's the tower in the ecclesia of God? It's a core ecclesia of men that gather and 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 direct the ecclesia as a whole with their decisions and and their recommendations and and how they govern and how they interpret the law of God, the law of Christ, in in making decisions. Uh, you know, in the spirit, right? That's that's the idea. That's what's supposed to happen. So. He built this tower in the middle of it. He also hewn out a wine vat in it. So you, there's going to be a testing of the fruit. And the whole point uh, of, of this, this, all this work is to get good fruit, you see. So if he goes through all this work and gets nothing, he said he expected to produce good grapes, but it produced only worthless ones. 
that that's a disappointment. And you've got like five out of seven of the ecclesiae in Revelations that produced worthless fruit. Okay. See, this this is, I don't know, when you when you think about it, all the work that God does to put together an ecclesia of God, um, those that are that are members of the ecclesia, they should respect that. I mean, you know, this this is something that you know, it's not as though, oh, you know, you know, he can just, he just does this a snap of his fingers and it's just like no, no sweat off his brow. This is stuff that he describes it like this because it is a lot of work that's being put, that's being invested. And, 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 and when an ecclesia of God just spits on it and, and, and takes it for granted and, and, and decides not to put in their own work in becoming the best king priest that they can be, that's disrespectful to God. Do you, do you see that? I mean, you, it's like spitting in his face after he's put in all this work and you're just going to throw it all away and produce garbage after he set you up. So that's just something to, to understand and think about as we pursue this lost ecclesia of God on this journey. Think about what God has to do and how he has to set this all up, how he has to call and prepare the hearts and call call the all the members of the body of Christ together and 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 inaugurate the 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 gathering and 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 the Holy Spirit dwelling it and 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 uh, and form this new covenant temple of God, designate this people of God, plant this this kingdom of God, this image of the kingdom of God on earth as an oasis that he's he does all that he designs it inside and out we talked about that he's the one that designs it inside and out okay and this is another another uh confirmation that this is all designed by god he built it he builds the tower he hews out the wine vat he 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 he's the one that digs all around it removes the stones he plants it he, you know he he gets the vine he gets the vine out of Egypt. He does it all. He designs it inside and out, the ecclesia of God, okay? Um, and I know, I think we've been through this passage before. Uh, and he goes, O inhabitants of Jerusalem, men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more can I do? I, I, I've done all this work. I, I, I put, put all this stuff together. What what more was there to uh, to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? Why why when I expected to produce good grapes did it produce worthless ones? Okay, and so and so what does he do? Let me tell you what I'm gonna I, what I'm gonna do to my vineyard. I'm gonna remove its hedge. I'm gonna remove the protection around it, and it will be consumed. See, that's what was happening uh, in Psalm eighty. I'm removing the hedge and it will be consumed. I will break down its wall and it will become trampled, trampled ground. God protects his ecclesia as long as the ecclesia is faithful, as long as the ecclesia per perseveres under the law of Christ. Okay. If it doesn't, that protection will be removed and the ecclesia will be destroyed. You see? I will lay it waste. It will. It will not be pruned. There's not going to be any. I'm, I'm basically going to withdraw. I'm not going to instruct. I'm not going to discipline. I'm not going to do any of that. Uh, briars and thorns will come up. Uh, no rain will fall on it. The spirit will will disappear. Okay. Um, and then he says, "For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. It's it's the kingdom of Israel." Okay. It's it's the the whole structure of of the where the people live in this house and there's there's administration and all this kind of stuff. It's like a kingdom, the house of Israel. That's what the vineyard is, and that's what the vineyard is in, uh, in under the new covenant. It's it's the new covenant kingdom of heaven, and and it's the ecclesia of God. That's the vi that's the vineyard under the new covenant. That's how the kingdom is expressed under the new covenant. We talked about all of this. Uh, and the men of Judah, his delightful plant, that's his kind of like his favorite. Um, and, 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 and there'll be favorite ecclesiae, right? There'll be favorite ecclesiae. Um, 
and, and does he look for justice, but behold bloodshed, righteousness, but behold a cry of distress. Okay. So it's just, it's just abandoning the law of Moses, uh, and, you know, and, 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 uh, righteousness and justice was, was abandoned and replaced with, uh, the letter and, and just a, a, a horrible in, in, interpretation of the law where mercy and justice was, was, was forgotten and forsaken. Uh, in in the uh, in the kingdom of Israel, um, the this is just a story of what can happen in the ecclesia of God. This it's exactly if, and we, we we've, we've talked about how to translate this stuff and how how to understand it, how it translates into the new covenant. We we've talked about all that, and how uh, this is, you know, exactly uh, what happens. You know, in in in, in Ecclesiai, that in Revelations uh, two three, what happened when the five, and um, and there was only two that looked like they were going to persevere, and, and they were going to make it, and they would receive the crown of life. We we discussed all that. So, um, but I wanted to to you know to show you because it, it again it relates right with this idea where, where Paul says, who plants a vineyard and does not eat the fruit of it? So this is the, this is, it's the same idea where if, if you're involved in this, in, in planting this vineyard and, and, and you're the one that one of the workers that God uses to plant this vineyard, uh, why wouldn't you be able to uh, uh, receive some benefit from this vineyard? as as it grows and it flourishes and and that's 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 what paul and these are these are all just these are examples that are just common sense even in satan's kingdom even in the world outside the kingdom of god these things were well known and accepted to be true you see so um that's why he uses these examples, but and and also because he he this is exactly what he did in Corinth. Okay, he planted this kingdom of God in Corinth. Okay, so these aren't just random things he was thinking of; these are things that he actually did. So he was a soldier. He plants a vineyard, uh, and who tends a flock that doesn't use the milk of the flock? Okay, so what does that mean? All right, um, and this is this is the idea where once the vineyard was planted, once the kingdom of God was established, he continued to train them and shepherd them, and 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 to show them how they were to conduct themselves as members of this kingdom, as citizens of this kingdom. As 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 members of the ecclesia of as 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 uh, as 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 each one fulfills its role as a as a, a member of the body of Christ as as the body parts of Christ working together and all that kind of stuff. So that's what that's what that's what that's about the the shepherd and and that's where we can go and look at um, Ephesians four. Okay, so no, now, now we can go to look at Ephesians 4 and look at what, what it means, what Paul means when he's being a shepherd and training these people and, and, and guiding them to become, uh, uh, you know, a, a mature ecclesia. To, and, and so, okay, so let's just look at the And so, so he, he's talking, uh, well, you know, obviously, this is a letter to Ephesus, the Ecclesia in Ephesus, um, and I'm not going to go too much into the background because it gets a little tricky here. Um, but right, right, I'm going to start at verse 11, and it says, "And he gave some as apostles, and some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors, some as teachers." Now, Paul, of course, filled all those roles. Okay. Uh, but there, but there are some that that you know. There are some prophets that aren't that aren't any of the rest of them. So, but these are all people that are are there to equip 
the saints, he says, for the equipping of the saints for the work of service or the work of ministry. Okay, all the saints are to minister. They're, they are the ministers. That's what, they're, that's, that's what they're supposed to do. They're the ministers. Not, not as the church system would lead you to believe. And they're, the way they designed it, that's completely off. All right. In the gathering, the ministers are the saints. Okay. Um, and they are there to build up the body of Christ. All right. And so, and we're going to look, okay, what is the body of Christ? I mean, what is, what does he mean by that? Um, so equipping of the saints, all the saints, by the way, not, not just the men, but all the saints that are part of this body of Christ. The body of Christ is not just the men. They are the core ecclesia. They make up the core ecclesia, but the, but the ecclesia as a whole includes the women, the children. Okay. So that's the whole ecclesia, the whole gathering, the whole body of Christ. All right. They all have body parts. They're all body parts of Christ. And, and, you know, some are, 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 are out of those body parts that everyone has different roles, right? So, um, this equipping of the saints for the work of the service or the work of ministry to the building up of the body of Christ. And then it says, and what is the goal? What, 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 what is, what is the goal of these saints as their minister to build up the entire body of Christ? What is their goal? Is to attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man. All right. So, Again, I've used this. I think I've used this uh, illustration before, but it's like a wheel with spokes. And in, when you begin in an ecclesia of God, the, you're you're on the outside of the wheel. You're all there. You're all gathered. You're all called to be part of this wheel, but you're, you know, you're distant. You're you're not. You're you're just starting. You're just beginning. As you as you perform the work of the ministry to build up the body of Christ and to edify one another, you start to move down the spokes of the wheel toward the hub. What is the hub? The hub is Jesus Christ. Okay, so you're moving, and, and I, I imagine the spokes are going to be moving at different speeds but you want, you need them all to move. They, you can't leave any spoke behind. They all need to move toward the hub. So you're all watching out for each other, helping each other, and, and making, you know, edifying one another so that they all move together toward the hub. That's the idea. And the, and the closer you move to Christ, the closer you become uh, conformed to the character of Christ, the mind of Christ, okay, then the closer you become come to each other. You become unified, more unified, the closer each becomes to, uh, to the, the character, conform to the character of Christ, the, the mind of Christ. So you're all moving towards Christ. And as you move towards Christ, you move toward each other and you become one in Christ. You see? Eventually, you, you, as you get to the hub, you're all one in Christ. That's, that's kind of the goal. That's the idea. That's the objective of an ecclesia of God. And you can't leave a spoke behind. If you don't get all the spokes to the hub, you're not finished. You, you need to keep working and working and working and get all the spokes to the hub. That's the idea. It doesn't... It, it, if you have a missing spoke or something like that, you, you're, you're, it's like a body being lame. It's a body missing a body part. And, and you don't want that. You want a full body. So you got to get all the body parts uh, moving together towards the hub and, and, become, and, and make up the full body of Christ. And that way you can fully express the person of Christ. You see? That, that's what this 
phrase is unity of the faith. The faith is the the uh, the process, the understanding of uh, you know all all of the kingdom of God and embracing the kingdom of God, the temple, the sacrificial system, um, understanding that you're king priest. You know you have these roles, uh, all of that kingdom of God, the law of Christ, keeping the law, uh, uh, you know, everything that we've talked about. That you administer the ecclesia of God properly, according to the law of Christ and how Christ has set it up. You you respect the design of God, as Christ taught it and as Paul showed it to us. You respect it. You, you obey it. That's all part of the faith. Okay? You don't leave the faith. You keep the faith. You want unity in the faith. You all agree on how to become mature, how it's going to happen. You all agree to that, and you have unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. You see, as you grow together towards that hub, as you become, as you conform to the character of Christ, the mind of Christ, that's when you have that knowledge of the Son of God. You become it, the Christ becomes more part of you, of who you are, right? That's what the knowledge is, okay? So, and, and we all attain it. We all attain it together. You see, we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. All of us. And when he says we here, he, he's identifying with the ecclesia at Ephesus. Okay, that's what he's doing right there. Okay, um, so that's the goal. And it says to a mature man, you'll be a full body with all the body parts to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ meaning that you will be a full body of Christ, okay? That, that, that your body, your, as a man, a mature man, you, you will be defined by Christ and you'll have the fullness of Christ, meaning that you'll express the full person of Christ as a body. You see, there's a lot there in that little sentence here that explains the objective of an ecclesia of God. It's really critical to understand all of it. You have to understand it. I like the, the illustration of, of, of the wheel. It gives, it, it helps, uh, at least it, 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 it helps me think about how that works. But that's how, that's what has to happen. You have to all come together okay, towards Christ and be unified in Christ and, and you become a mature man, mature, okay? And, and uh, then you're able to become a authentic body of Christ, truly expressing the person of Christ, hearing his instructions, walking in the Spirit, being sensitive to the Spirit's uh, guiding and guidance because the Spirit is, is being led by the head. The head, remember we talked about the body being, you have these body parts and the Spirit is the nervous system that's connected to the mind and you have the mind of Christ that sends the messages along the nervous system to tell the body parts what to do, to coordinate the body parts so that the body parts are coordinated together and they're synergistic in their movements. They, they actually are much greater as a whole than they would be as individuals, right? It's, synerg it's synergistic, just like your body is synergistic, okay? So this, this is kind of the idea where you become that tuned to the spirit, that connected to the nervous system, to the spirit, and that, that's completely connected like at lightning speed to the mind of Christ as, the, as Christ directs his body. You see? 
That's how it's supposed to work. That's the idea. And it's, it's, it's an amazing idea. It's shocking. It's mind-blowing. It's one of those things that you're going, there's no way, okay? And believe me, Paul understands that. And he talks about it in his other letters. The, the, well, he, you know, the, he calls it a mystery, this whole idea of this body of Christ and all that. It's a, and, and people don't understand that and when, when, he, when he talks about the mystery. But it it because it's never really referenced in the Old Testament, this idea of the body of Christ. It's not really there's only one passage, there's only one like like passage that or account that that could give a clue, but nothing like what's really what Paul what Paul describes as the body of Christ and how this ecclesia is supposed to work. But this is this is how the glorified ecclesia works. You, do you understand? This, this is how the glorified or the grand ecclesia uh, of God works. The grand ecclesia will work this way, and we are to be an image of that here on earth. So this is our goal. This is our goal. This is the objective. And do and you, and you understand how much effort that's going to take, you know, to, to attain that as, 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 as a whole? Okay, that's not easy. Obviously, that's not easy. That's why it consumes your life. It consu- Ecclesia of God consumes your life. You don't have any time for the frivolous nonsense that we do today. You don't have any time for that. You're doing this. You're trying to, you're trying to make this happen, right? And, and, and doing this, becoming a mature man, and, 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 and tr- achieving the unity of the faith and, the, and of the knowledge of the Son of God, it's, that is like, <laughs> wow. Okay, once once that goes on your plate, you don't have any room for anything else on your plate. Do you, do you know what I mean? That fills up the plate. Okay, once you put that on your plate, you're kind of you're overwhelmed already. You don't have room or time for all the other nonsense that fill up our fills up our time today. Okay, this is hardcore. This is what you're, you're, you're supposed to do, you're commanded to do, you're directed to do, and this is your job. This is what you are to do. This is what it means to seek the kingdom of God first, first priority. This is what it means right there. And that's a lot of work. That's a lot of time. But that's it. You, you you understand how when people walk, you know, they think, what am I supposed to do? And the, 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 the church, the church system confuses everybody and you got to find your calling. You got to figure out what, what is, what am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to live? What am I, you know, what am I, what ministry am I supposed to, 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 to pursue? What's, what's my calling? What's my calling? I, I, now I'm a Christian. What, how do I serve God? You see everyone asking that question in the church system. It's just it's just a question that just that has dogged me my whole life and I'm sure it's dogged anybody that's been grown up and programmed and and been trained in the church system. It dogs them their whole life. I, I don't know what I don't know what I'm is God using me? I don't know. Maybe God's using me somehow. I don't know. I hope God's using me. I hope I'm fulfilling something, some ministry somewhere. I don't know. Am I called to to be, you know, a campus crusade, or am I called to be, you know, uh, I I don't know. All these programs are so many of them. Which one? Which one is mine? Which one is my calling? And and you just uh, like I don't know. I guess what am I supposed to do? just pick one? Do I just pick one and just pretend like? Like God called me there. I don't know how to do that. I don't know. I don't know how other people do it, right? So that's how you grow up. That's how we've been trained. That's how we think. But the fact is, this is your calling. You're, you've been called from the very beginning, if the church system would let you know that you've been called to seek first the kingdom of God. This is the kingdom of God on earth, right here, the ecclesia of God, and this is what you are to do. And believe me, you don't have time for anything else. This will fill up your entire life. 
That's your calling. Okay? So everybody knows. So everything's clear. Now you know your calling. Now you know. You don't have to search anymore. Forget all that. Looking for, you know, a ministry. Here's your ministry. The work of ministry. There's your ministry right there. Okay? This is what this is what's in scripture. Maybe we should follow that instead of this the pulpit propaganda. Okay? Maybe we should look at scripture and see what our calling is. And it's very clear all saints are called to this. Okay? I don't care what the I don't care what the, the, the church system tells you. It's all nonsense. It's garbage. I've been called as a pastor to, you know, shepherd this flock and, you know, to set up this church. Oh, come on. That's, that, 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 you just, it's just made up. They make this stuff up and they cherry pick certain scriptures to kind of support it. They, they think it's important. But anyone that reads it, reads the scripture, you, you're not going to come to that conclusion. Anyway, so this is our calling. Okay, this is what, this is what Paul was doing and training this ecclesia as a shepherd, as an apostle, I mean, as all of these things, really. Training these guys to equipping these saints for this ministry, and this is the ministry they are to do, they are to perform, and it'll take the rest of their lives, and it'll fill up all of their time. Do you see why you can't serve God and mammon at the same time? You don't have time. You don't have the energy. You see, once you, once you take this on, you're wiped out. Okay? So this, this is what I'm saying. And then it says, as a result, so this, since this is our objective, right? Paul says this is our objective. As a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. You see, when the, the problem is this. When you're not rooted in Scripture, when you're not rooted in your faith, in your conviction, and and the only way that I, and 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 it's probably not the only way because, you know, the disciples had Jesus, they didn't have the New Testament, and there were many New Testament believers that didn't have the New Testament, and um, but they were believers under the New Covenant, and they were the only thing they could do is translate it from the old covenant to understand more this particular uh this particular truth right here though that we're talking about right now is you you're not going to find a translation it, it's not really it, it's not really uh made available under under the old that's why paul calls it a mystery that was that was hidden until now it, it, it this is this is the concept that is so hardcore this is what makes makes this is probably what makes the ecclesia of god and it more of an image of the grand ecclesia than anything else this the, it's this this uh this objective here this project this idea of becoming one as as the body parts, unity and diversity in Christ, and 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 all of that that we just talked about, that is that is like the cornerstone. That that is like the 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 unique feature of an ecclesia of God that makes it that 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 is is the biggest feature of the image of of the kingdom of God. Okay, that's the big upgrade right there, and it was a mystery. It will. It really wasn't discussed under the under the old covenant, so it's you can't really translate it. Okay, it and like I said, the only thing I, I the only the only passage in the old covenant that might discuss it is the, is that time when we talked about it where he gave gifts of craftsmanship and and then they were to work together to build the tabernacle. 
that that's probably the best you know illustration i mean it's not it's not a good illustration i mean it's, it's just the the best that the old covenant can can give you i don't know any better illustration than that and that's not a very good one you're you're not going to get that same idea of what's what we're talking about here that's why the body the body of christ this idea of the body this illustration of the body is so majorly uh, incredibly informative and and instructive about how this works that that's that idea that paul came up with i don't know if he came up with it but the spirit gave it to him but it's that body of christ but this you know it's funny because it, you know, we were, we were given this body and designed with this body for a reason. It it it's it's part of 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 God's revelation of how He works and His ways. This is part of how the Queen. This this is this is an illustration of the Queen and how the Queen behaves and what the Queen looks like and 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 it and describes the queen and and how it operates how she operates right by looking at our own body we're going oh okay wow okay now i so anyway i uh, i'm sorry to hammer that but it's just such an amazing concept it, it's just it's just so mind blowing when you think about it and and the problem is nobody thinks about it you know nobody thinks about it they just blow it off because they can't get their head around it. So they say, ah, never mind. I'm just going to repass. I'm just going to forget it. But anyway, that's our goal. That's our objective. And as a result, he's saying, look, you have to get rooted in Scripture. You have to get, you have to get your faith like completely cemented on the rock. You have to understand where the rock is. You have to find the rock and you just got to start building on the rock. You can't be carried away. You can't be, you know, being flipped around all the time with doubt and uncertainty, and 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 this 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 uh, this feeling that you're not resolved. You, it's still unresolved in your mind. It's still unresolved about what it means to be, uh, you know, what 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 it is. This gospel of the kingdom of God. It's still unresolved in your head what it means if you are living in that unresolved state you you you're not very you're not worth anything yet you 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 you're not ready yet you have to be grounded you have to be convicted and 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 completely and and I mean completely persuaded okay to to really act on it in faith, you, you, that's that's the kind of and the only way to do that that I can ever imagine, you know, at least in this age, you know, because we don't have Paul, we don't have Jesus, we don't have these people. The only way to really become resolved and determined and convicted and and settled in your mind, instead of living in a state of doubt and uncertainty. And, and lack of resolution, the only way to do that is to read the scripture, test it, and wrestle with it, and vet it, and just go to town with it, and just put a lot of time in it. How else are you going to become one that is completely resolved and completely confident? Because if you're just going off of what someone says, then the next guy that comes along that might be more charismatic, that might have an interesting twist, that might say, you know, you know, that's close, but this is the real deal. What are you gonna do? Okay, you're gonna kind of, oh, well, maybe, maybe he's, maybe he's got the real, you know, may, he kind of sounds cool. Maybe I'll go over there, or, or maybe, maybe this other guy. The, you know the devil is very tricky he's very deceitful you give him just a little window and he will blow it open okay you it says if you're not resolved you can't you're you're like a child 
If you're not resolved and convicted and firm and established and, and rooted, then you're like a child. You can be tossed uh, here and there by waves. The, you know, here's the next uh, idea. Woo, look at that. Well, that sounds good. Let's ride that wave for a while. And then here comes another wave. Let's ride that wave for a while. You're just, you're not anchored. You, you got nothing. You, you, you're just you're just all over the place. That's how Satan wants you. Because someone that's not anchored can't do anything. Uh, you know, unfortunately, they're like kids. They're like children. They're not worth, they're, you can't use them. God can't use them. You have to be resolved and confident and sure. And otherwise, you can be easily tricked. Okay? You can be easily deceived easily. It's not hard, okay, with, with someone that's not certain, because you're not going to be able to vet and test uh, different ideas, uh, different approaches, different perspectives. You're not going to be able to vet it. You have, you, you're you like helpless. I don't know what to do. How, how do I know which one is true? Who Who's right? I don't know. It's because you don't have any skills to look at scripture and read scripture and to understand it and to vet it. You, you, you have to be rooted, okay? It's too easy to deceive people. Oh, I think the Spirit's leading me over there. Oh, I think the Spirit's leading me over there now. Maybe over there. That guy sounds good. I think the Spirit's leading me. You don't even know what the Spirit's saying. The Spirit is talking to you through Scripture. He, he, he spent a lot of time writing Scripture, right? The Spirit put the Scripture together for you to learn, for you to understand. And 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 yes, you this, the spirit will guide you through the scripture, to 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 inform you, to give you the ideas, to help you understand as you read it. But you've got to study it, you've got to meditate on it. That takes hours. So that that's that's really key. Because if you're in a result, if you're in that state of doubt, of questions, of of non-resolution, where where you you're just still wondering, you'll never grow up. You'll stay a child and you'll be useless. You're not useful to God in that state. So um, so then he says, okay, so we, we can't do that anymore. This is our goal. You're never going to reach that goal if you're a child being tossed here and there. You'll never reach it. Okay, that can't happen. It, it's, a, it's a sure fail. So you, you can't do that, but, but instead, speaking the truth in love, okay, uh, and you got to know what the truth is, right? You, you got to be resolved about what is the truth. You got to be completely certain what is the truth. That's the whole point, okay? Speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him. Again, it's that idea of of right here where it says we we have the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the son of god you have to grow together towards christ and understanding christ and you have to understand what, how the process works you have to be completely resolved about that and completely uh uh persuaded about that how the process works what it means to be an ecclesia of God. Okay, so um, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him uh, who is the head, even Christ. Okay, again, it's like the spokes on a wheel. The hub is Christ. Um, from whom, okay, so it's, it's, it's he, is, he is our hub, he is our goal, and, and it's from Christ the whole body, meaning Christ is the one giving direction. Christ is the one overseeing and, and disciplining and rebuking. And, and, and he's giving us a lot of input and guidance as the great shepherd in guiding his body how to become one. Uh, so from whom the whole body, okay, 
And then it has a parenthetical here, being fitted and held together by what every jo every joint supplies. Now, this is the idea that everyone fills a role as, as a member, as a body part. You're a member of the body of Christ. Each one is a member of the body of Christ. Each one's a body part. So you're fitted. In other words, he designed this ecclesia so that all the body parts are represented. So you're all fitted together, right? We talked about that. You're fitted together. All the body parts are coming together. They're all called to form one full body of Christ, but you have to, you have to become one to be, to be, to, to be a mature man and to, and to, uh, 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 where, where to the measure of the stature, which belongs to the fullness of Christ. That's the way Paul put it. That's hard to understand what that means, but you have to become one to the point where you can express the full person of Christ. So that's the idea. All the body parts are here. Now you have to join them together. So they're fitted and held together by whatever every joint supplies. So every body part has to be performing. Every spoke has to be coming towards the hub. It all has to happen together. So you're held together. You're, you're, you're being, uh, you're being, uh, I, I, I pulled together. You're getting pulled together, right? And being you be, becoming unified by whatever every joint supplies all the to edify one another. So all the body parts are working together, holding and pulling each other towards each other to become one. And so you're held together by what every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part. Each individual part has to be working properly. Each body part has to work. You can't, there's no one can be left behind. You see? Uh, okay. So th this is how, this is how it all operates. This is how the oneness is attained. This is the process. Okay, and it all starts with speaking the truth in love. You have to love one another as Christ loved his disciples. Okay, that means you lay down your life. You do whatever it takes, but you never let go of the truth. You don't tell people what they want to hear. You can't. That's not helping. You will never come together as one in Christ if you're telling people what they want to hear. Okay? Unless they want to hear the truth, <laughs> then, then I guess it's okay. But you have to tell the truth. You have to know the truth first. You have to know the truth. And that, that means you have to grow up. You can't be a child. You can't be in this unresolved uh, state of doubt and questions and uncertainty. You can't be there. You have to study. You have to work. You have to figure it out. You can, you can help each other figure it out, of course, but you have to get resolved that you understand what it is. You see it. And if the spirit is inside, we should uh, come to an agreement. Okay, this is what, this is what it looks like. Now, we got to use this process. We got to use we got to step out in faith on the truth, on this idea of the ecclesia of God. You got to step out, resolved, firmly planted, firmly rooted, not a child, anchored, okay, um, and pursue it, okay. That that's that's what it means, and 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 when you do that, you speak this truth in love. While in the ecclesia, that's when you start to grow up in all aspects of him, okay? That's when things start to happen. And that's when you start to become one. And, and, and so every body part has to, has to be engaged. Every single one. Every single one. The women, the children, they all have to be engaged. And the children may, may you know, their, their engagement may be just, okay, you, you got to be quiet. And you got to listen. And you have to absorb. You know, that may be their engagement. doesn't mean you're talking. It doesn't mean you're talking when you're engaged. It means that you're supporting, that you're, uh, that you're uh, being 
faithful to your role. That's what it means. You're being faithful to your role in obedience. And you're praying. And and you're uh and you're believing. Okay. So th- this is what it means according to pro- proper work of each part. So and so that's all parenthetical. So from whom the whole body, and let's okay, this whole part being fitted. Let me let me just, in fact, let me just put that as a different color just for funsies. Okay. That way, uh we can that's a parenthetical kind of like okay let's i because i want to keep the sentence tight i want to keep it tight from whom the whole body causes the growth of the body you see how that works the whole body causes the growth of the body and 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 this parenthetical gives more detail about how that works but in the big picture is it's the body that causes the growth of the body. Okay. But the body is receiving instructions from Christ. The body is receiving all, all their guidance from Christ. This is their goal. This is the objective. They learn. This is what they focusing on is Christ. So as Christ instructs the body with the spirit and, 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 and we learn about Christ and we understand Christ, through the Spirit and the Scriptures, okay, then the whole body causes the growth of the body. For the building up of itself, right? Building up of the body in love. Okay? That's how they know you're a disciple of Christ, is how you love one another. That's in John 13, remember? So, this is... uh, this is really a, a critical passage to really understand the objective of the ecclesia of God, the process of how to get, how to attain that objective in an ecclesia of God, and it it it, it just gives you a big picture about what we're talking about in an ecclesia of God and what your role is and what your job is. Now, there's lots of details that need to be filled in, but this this is kind of you know, to to kind of get a big picture of what we're talking about, this is it. And these apostles and these prophets and these they are what is their job? They're just to equip the saints to do all this work, to do this ministry, to make this happen. And these saints, what are all these saints? These these saints make up the full body of Christ. These this is these saints are the full body of Christ. Now within the full body of Christ, there's the core ecclesia that kind of operates as the one giving direction, the tower in the vineyard. They're the ones giving direction, and they need prayer. They they need to be very receptive to the Spirit, and they need support, because if they do something wrong, if they mess it up, the whole ecclesia goes down the toilet. And, And, you know, you can't have that. So God builds this tower, this core ecclesia and this this ecclesia of men this group of men they need to function really well and but all the body parts need to function well okay and part of the part of the bo- other body parts are going to be praying for the core not to mess it up right not to get it wrong and 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 just cause all kinds of havoc that that's 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 key so everyone has a role everyone has a job to do and the women are going to be teaching women and children that's how it works we're going to see that in chapter 11 the women have their domain they rule also and they need to the older women teach the younger women and 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 the and the younger women teach the children it's all part of a hierarchy that, that God has set up, it's not about power, it's about roles. It's all about roles. And you may not like your role, the men that may not like their role. It's too much responsibility, too much pressure. But that's what they, that you've been given. But actually, there's pressure on everyone. Everyone has that pressure. Everyone has pressure to perform. 
every single body part has a pressure to perform. So that's the way it works. And that's why we're there to help each other, encourage each other, and, and to, um, you know, and to edify one another. That's what we're there to do. But this is our, this is the goal. You have an objective. You're not just getting together to have fun and, and, and to, to and, and to, you know, chit chat and, to, and to have this, you know, quote unquote fellowship that, that is just really uh, a word that we use today, uh, that's completely misconstrued the idea of fellowship, but, but this, this word of just kind of being friendly and, and, you know, and just having fun together. You have a job as an ecclesia of God. It's a job. It's a goal. It's an objective. You got to get there. You got to focus. Everyone has that job it's, and everyone plays a major role in it. Okay. Even though you don't think, oh, I'm just a foot. Well, you know, what, what can I, you know, I don't feel like I'm part of the body. No, you are. You're, 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 uh, in, you, you, you are a key part of the body. Every part needs to perform. So that, that's kind of how it works. Um, and, and, and this is what the shepherd does. You know, this, this pastor, he's, he, you know, he, he says the shepherd about the milk of the flock, um, the shepherd is free to use the milk of the flock. Uh, okay, and and so he's he's again uh, appealing to this this common understanding in in the world, even in even amongst the gentile, even amongst the unbelievers, that these principles apply. You know, you've got the soldier, the planter of the vineyard, and the shepherd, and they all. Are, are are given this this right to uh imbibe or to take part in in their project in what they're doing you know the planter has a right to share in the fruit of the vineyard the shepherd has a right to share in the milk of the flock okay so this is uh the these illustrations are not just out of thin air these are illustrations that he uses because this is exactly what he did in Corinth. Okay. Um, all right. So now, now he, these, again, these illustrations are, are just common understanding, even among the unbelievers, but this is never, you never, you can never stop there, even though, yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense, Paul. Okay. I get you. I got you. All right, so you shouldn't be entitled to free room and board. All right. Well, that Paul's not, Paul is not, even though all these illustrations are really killer illustrations and are really good, but Paul is not satisfied with that. He says, uh, I am not speaking these things according to human judgment, am I? In other words, these are things that you take from common sense. These are adages maybe that the world adopts and embraces. Uh, unbelievers are in agreement with all this, but this is just human judgment. Okay, he's got Paul's never satisfied with that. All right, that that's never enough. He says, or does not the law also say these things? Okay, so now he needs to root this human judgment, this human, these human adages, these these uh, ideas that the unbelievers accept, along with the believers, they accept all this stuff. But he says, no, 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 that's not enough. We need to root this in scripture. We need to root this. Is this, is this also a heavenly truth? Is what Paul's saying. We got to make sure this is a truth that exists in the kingdom of God, not just in, in the world uh, as we know it, it with, with the unbeliever and everyone else. But we, we need to make sure that this truth also can be supported and accepted and adopted and embraced in the kingdom of God. You see, that's important because there's a lot of stuff that the world might accept, but is not accepted in the kingdom of God. So don't just take anything that someone might agree with that, 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 that you think is common knowledge and yeah, 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 of course that's true. Yeah, it's, it's, it's common knowledge and, 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 and common acceptance in the world as we see it, as we live in it, but it may not be accepted in the kingdom of God. And that's, 
that's the key. It has to be accepted in the kingdom of God. So he says, um, for it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing. Okay. Now that seems like an esoteric law that is just like, and by the way, this is in Deuteronomy 25, 4, and it basically says just, just that. You shouldn't muzzle the ox while he's threshing. Now what is threshing? Threshing is, is the idea where you have these, these, uh, these kernels of grain that is, is covered with a husk and you're trying to get rid of the husk and, and just kind of get, get to the kernels. And so you're breaking the husk and, 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 and throwing the husk to the ground and, and leaving the kernels there. And there's all kinds of threshing machines. And I don't know exactly how they threshed in, uh, in Paul's day. I don't, I don't rem remember exactly how it works. I, some, some, I, th I thought they, they kind of walked around a wheel or something like that. And, but I don't, I don't remember how it, how it actually works. Um, but the idea was to get rid of the husk around the kernel grain and to keep the kernel because that's, that's the actual fruit of, of the grain. That's what you want to keep. That's what you can use for making bread and, and whatnot. The, the husk is, you don't want that. So, um, so that's what threshing is. So after you harvest it, after you cut it down, you, you go and you thresh it to, to get rid of all the, the stuff you can't use and to get that little kernel. That's what you want. So, um, and, and, and the oxen, the oxen were used in, in, in making this threshing and doing this threshing, you know, that they were used to accomplish this, goal, this task. And, and the idea is you're not supposed to muzzle the ox while he's threshing. Well, why not? Why, why can't we muzzle the ox while we're threshing? It's, you're not being cruel to the ox by muzzling the ox. Because it's not like you're not feeding the ox. You're, you're going to feed the ox after he's done. He'll get his food. He'll get his water. Everything will be fine. Okay. So the ox is not going to be hurt in any real degree by muzzling him. Okay. So And, that, and that's what he says. He says, uh, God is not concerned about oxen, is he? No. It, it, it's there's no harm to the ox by muzzling the, the ox while he's threshing. I mean, it may be a little uncomfortable, but there's no real harm to the ox. And, and why would they want to muzzle the ox while he's threshing? Because they don't want the ox to stop and start chewing on grain and stopping production. It makes the job go slower if the if the ox is not muzzled. You see, when the ox is muzzled, the ox has no reason to stop. And he just gets the job done faster. And then he gets his food. And then he gets his water. He gets all the stuff and, and petting or whatever they do. They care for the ox. They need the ox. They're not gonna, they're not gonna abuse the ox. They need the ox. So they're making a, they're gonna make sure they take care of the ox. That's not the issue. But it's obviously the work's gonna go faster if you muzzle the ox while they're threshing. Because they're going to be tempted to, to stop and grab some grain and chew on that. They go a little slower. If, if, they, if they're going to get their food after the job's done, guess what? They're going to get that job done faster, right? It's kind of an incentive. So they're, they're reward. But God says, don't do that. I says, I, I know why you'd want to do that, but don't do it. I don't want you to do it. Don't muzzle. And, and, the, and the Jews are going, oh, why? You know, what's the big deal? You know, everyone's happy if you muzzle. It's just, they think everything, everyone's better off. I mean, the ox might be a little uncomfortable. And that, it's no big deal. It's not a big deal. They'll be fine. So it's not really for the ox. It's not, God didn't make the, all, the, 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 the law for the ox. So why did he make the law? You see, these are the questions that I'm not, I'm not saying that Paul was the only one that thought about this and that, that understood why, you know, the answer to this. this. This could have been taught to him when he was a child by all the rabbis. And there's a lot of people that thought about the law and about what these laws mean and why these laws were given. These rabbis, what do you think they did? They worked hard on, on searching scripture and figuring this stuff out. They asked these questions. 
They were scribes. They studied. They thought about things. They meditated. They thought about things. So I'm not saying that, that Paul was the one that came up with this. Paul could have been taught this when he was a child. This is like old news. Everyone knows this. Right? As a Jew, especially a Jew of, of his you know, education, he could have been taught this and many other things that we don't know about. But but anyway, uh, I don't know how you know. So I I don't know. I can't I can't say for certain whether he was the one that figured this out or whether lots of rabbis figured this out. This has been an, an understanding for a long time. I don't know. But you shall not muzzle. He's not concerned about the ox, or is he speaking altogether for our sake? In other words, the reason why God made this law after thinking about it and meditating on it, it couldn't have been for the ox. So why would God do it? Was it just for fun? For, for funsies? Was he just kind of like, uh, you know, maybe he thought it would be good for the ox. Maybe maybe he was mistaken. Maybe, you know, no. He, did. He, he does things on purpose. God says things and does things on purpose. And you have to, you have to, under, you have to, when you read scripture, you have to assume that God is very, very smart. <laughs> and he just doesn't do fillers. He just doesn't put stuff in just to put stuff in. It may seem like that. It's because you don't understand it. It may seem like that. But it's never true. Things are done for a reason. Things are done for a purpose. Just because you can't figure it out doesn't mean it wasn't done for a purpose. It just means you can't figure it out. It's, it's, it's just, you just you don't see it yet. And you may see it later. Okay? So... This is what I'm saying. And, and when you read scripture, understand that God is extremely intelligent and he just doesn't throw a bunch of stuff in because it sounds good or because it sounds real pious. That's not how scripture is written. Everything is written for a reason. It's up to you to figure that out by studying, understanding, researching, using the spirit, asking the spirit to guide you, all of that. Okay, but too many people just read past stuff and say, ah, oh, that's just, you know, whatever. That really doesn't mean anything. That's not true. It's just that you don't understand it yet. Okay, that's, that's you know, there's a lot of things that we just don't understand. And, and we just think that it's, you know, it's not important. It is important. You just have to continue to work to understand it. Okay, um, so, uh, so, so Paul says, look, God is not concerned about the ox. He's speaking for our sake. And what is he saying? Why, is he, why does he give this law? Uh, because the plowman ought to plow in hope and the thresher to thresh in hope of sharing the crops. Okay. Is, is the, that's added by, by the New American Standard. And this is added. But I think that's probably right. Those are, those are you know, that's, that's the intent. So, um, so it's this idea that it's for it, it. It's kind of a principle that that God wanted the people of Israel to to embrace, that they should not uh, restrict the workers in the fields, and 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 the threshers and those from enjoying. Uh, they're kind of like a small stakeholder in the project they're working on. They're like a small stakeholder, and that's. I think is endorsed by God as a way of, of, of kind of, uh, you know, the contribution to the labor of men is that the labor of men when they're, when they're plowing, when they're threshing is that they have a stake in the success of what they're doing. Okay. They have a stake in it. All right. So, and that's that's part of this hope in in labor and working in on this earth, and that's important. You know that's that's why corporations give out shares to their to the top people, is to give them a stake in the success of the corporation. You see this this idea of giving people a stake in what they're doing is 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 it's just it's just a it's a very wise and prudent way of 
dealing with labor. Okay, it makes labor a little less laborious, right? And a little less tedious is when you think you have a stake in it. That's why people get commissions, you know, and they're 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 incentivized to 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 go out there and and sell their product or you know make deals so they because they have a little stake in it in their success. So it's it's just that kind of a principle that's being. And, and and it's used all the time. It, it, it's it, it's understood to be a wise principle in in, in dealing with labor. Um, so th that's that's what that's what God is doing. That's what He's demonstrating, and He's illustrating by this by this law. Okay, and and those that are seeking truth and seeking to understand will will get that. Okay, that's that's what Paul's saying. So so okay so. He goes, um, uh, where pl you're plowing in hope, uh, you're threshing in hope, this idea of having a stake in it, a few, you know, something that's going to happen that if it's successful, you're going to get a little piece. So it, it, now he's applying it to himself. Now he's applying it to what he does. So if we sowed spiritual things in you, is it too much if we reap material things? things from you. You see, now this, uh, what's interesting here um, is that, uh, okay, l what he's saying here is that we're sowing spiritual things. Now, these spiritual things are eternal matters. These are kind of like the big time. We're giving you benefits that are eternal not ephemeral, not temporary, not things that are, that are going to burn up or are going to spoil. These benefits we're giving you will never end. You see, that's pretty huge. You can't give a, be a better benefit than that, eternal benefits, right? You can't help somebody any better than helping out their eternal soul. Okay? That is you know you that that is the best present you could ever get is someone to help out your eternal soul and 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 to give you an eternal benefit so so the idea of sowing spiritual things in you what should you get in return you should get some eternal benefit in return you're you're sowing you're giving eternal benefits why shouldn't you receive eternal benefits in return but they're not able to do that. They're not in a position to be able to give eternal benefits to Paul. Okay? They're still trying to learn what they're doing. They, they, they don't know what's going on. Right? They're still trying to figure it out. So they can't return the favor. So, so he's saying, is it too much to ask to, to reap material things from you? These, these ephemeral stuff, the stuff that's going to spoil the stuff that's going to burn, you know, the stuff that comes and goes, it's a temporary benefit. I mean, we're giving out eternal benefits and, and is it, and I know you can't give it back, but is it too much to ask to give you a, a temporal benefit like food and shelter and water? Is that too bad? I mean, is that too much to ask? I mean, he's basically saying, look, You know, this idea that we have a right to these things, it, it should be like, well, yeah, of course. You, I mean, of course. I mean, are you kidding? After And these were real benefits, by the way. These aren't fake benefits. These aren't fake benefits. He's not misleading these people. He's already shown proof that this everything he said works and is true. And, and they've seen it. This isn't fake stuff. This isn't stuff like, I'm going to teach you this passage. And and then you know uh, you know good luck with that. And by the way, I misled you. This isn't these aren't the things that the the church system would give you. They don't give eternal benefits. They mislead you. They send you down the wrong path. We we should they should be paying us, right? So this idea of uh, you know uh, if, if the church system uses this kind of stuff to to support their idea that they should receive a salary, which is a completely different concept.
That's not a concept that Paul's talking about. So, but but even if they w- were to try to do that, you know, first of all, you got to give them a benefit. And what you're doing is misleading us. So that's not a benefit. Okay. You're you're kind of robbing us of of heavenly wealth, actually, by not by not showing us the, the narrow road, by not showing us the way of salvation, by not really describing the, the full gospel of the kingdom of God. You're robbing us of that opportunity. You're misleading us so that we're not looking for it. We think that we know it and we don't. You're deceiving us. Okay. You're making us impotent. So that's not a benefit. All right. Just to be clear. Okay. Um, but, but Paul, when he gave out these benefits, they were, they were obvious. They, they were measurable. You could see them. You could see how the ecclesia of God was formed and how it was inaugurated and all these healings and all the stuff that the Spirit was doing. And, and they could, and their eyes were opened and they could understand all of this stuff was really, really obvious. It was no doubt in anyone's mind that he sowed spiritual things in them. No one questioned that. That was never a question. And that's why, um, you know, when he, when he makes that statement, that he has the standing to make a, such a statement, first of all. He has that standing because uh, he actually does confer spiritual benefits. Now, um, and and let me just let me just show you uh, some of the things that and this is why he would glory in. Uh, okay, I had to start over. I guess. Um, let's see. A uh, Okay, first of all, all right. So let's look at this right here. Uh, and and this explains why he says what he says. Like he's he's talking to the ecclesia in Thessalonica, and he says. Nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others, even though as apostles of Christ, we may we might have a wait a minute, is that what I want want to look at? That doesn't make sense. No, that's not what I want to look at. <laughs> I want to look at verse 19. Sorry. Yeah, that's what I want to look at. Because that didn't make sense. That's not that's not what I'm talking about. All right, so let's talk about what I'm talking about. All right. Um you know, he's talking to them and he just says, look, we're trying to get to you. Satan has hindered us. Uh, but then he says, for who is our hope or joy or crown of exaltation? You see, these are all things that, that Paul's saying, uh, the, you, because of what the work that we get, that we put into you and because we, we, we sowed these spiritual things in you, we are going to receive eternal rewards. And these eternal rewards are going to be given by God because he's the one that can give them. And he says, who is our hope, our joy, our crown, our crown of exaltation? All of this stuff, all these eternal benefits, these eternal rewards, who is that? Is it not even you? You. You're, the idea that you flourish as a kingdom of God, as, a, as an image of the kingdom of God in Thessalonica, that that you as an ecclesia of God are flourishing and persevering. I mean, this is this, by the way, this is written very soon after he was there. So there's not a lot of time that, that's taken place, maybe six months, maybe seven, eight months, I don't know. Not a lot of time that's taken place. So it, the testing still has yet to really uh, you know, come forward. But but for for right now, the way the way it's looking, it's looking really good, apparent according to Paul. And so he is really excited about the fact that he is going to receive some eternal rewards because his work is showing such great fruit. Okay. And and he has a stake in it. He has a stake in their success. If they're successful, he is a stakeholder in their success. Because he was part of it. He plowed with the hope of sharing in the crops, in the fruit. He planted the vineyard in the, in the hopes of sharing in the, in the fruit of it. You see, so he's going to share in it. And, and this is what he's talking about here. For he, who is our hope, our joy, our crown of exaltation? Is it not even you uh, in the presence of our Lord Jesus at his coming? So when, when he comes, they are going to benefit from their success. You see, that's the 
that's the gist of it. That's the point. That's it, it, It's all the same theme. It's all the same concept of, of the plowman sharing in the crops, uh, of the of the you know, shepherd sharing in, in the milk. Uh, you know, all of this, this idea that they're a small stakeholder in the success of this ecclesia. So they're very excited. They want the ecclesia to succeed because they get a little piece of it. Okay. For you are our glory and joy, he says. Okay. This is why he says these things. All right. This this is the principle that he's he's working on, working under. So whatever success that comes out of his work and his planting and his being a soldier for Christ and then and then going and planting the vineyard and then shepherding the flock, all that work that he's put in, sowing these spiritual things, he has a stake, a stake in it now. So if they're successful, so is he. He shares in that success. Okay? That's that's the point. That's why he says those things. Um, and another... Okay, so uh, here's another example. In 2 Corinthians 1.14, um, for we write nothing else to you than what we what what you read and understand. Okay, I'm not going to go into all, all that the stuff before. He says, I hope you will understand until the end. I hope you persevere to until the end, he's saying. This is his hope. And why? Uh, just as you also partially did understand us. Okay, you you partially understood us in the beginning. It was obviously partial. As you read 1 Corinthians, there's such a mess. There's they they They've misunderstood quite a bit, but they partially understood some things, right? So you partially understood this, that we are your reason to be proud. You, you should be proud of us, okay? Because, um, oh, wait a minute, how does this work? You are your reason, we are your reason to be proud. In other words, they're proud of themselves because they followed Paul, because they're, they, they have embraced the message from Paul. Uh, you see, because Paul is a true apostle. So why wouldn't they be proud to choose a true apostle to follow in, in his message? Okay, so that that is part of the reason why they should be pleased with themselves because they chose the right one to follow. They chose the right one to listen to. to they chose the right message to embrace. Okay, we are your reason to be proud. Okay. And as you also are ours in the day of our Lord Jesus. So uh, the, the team of Paul can be proud of the success of the Corinthian Ecclesia. They can be pleased and they and, and, and with the success of the Corinthian Ecclesia because they, they have a stake in it. You know. So it's it's they share, they share the, the success of, of the ecclesia. They're both sharing it. They're all sharing it. So, um, uh, what's here's another example, maybe a better one. Uh, let's see what this one says in Philippians two sixteen. Um, holding fast the word of life, so that in the day of Christ, I will. Ha okay, let me let me just. It says, "Do all things without grumbling or disputing." so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. See, you're like an oasis in the desert. You're a little image of the kingdom of God in, in, this, in the kingdom of Satan. Okay, that's what you're doing. That's who you are. You're, 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 you're in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, and you are to be blameless and innocent and children of God above reproach in the midst of this thing among whom you appear as lights in the world, right? And, and we talked about that. And, and, you know, the idea of lights could be that there may be many different ecclesiae in the city of Philippi. So it's, it may not be just one. It may be many, and there are lights in the world in that respect. Holding fast the word of life, you're persevering, so that in the day of Christ... I will have reason to glory because I did not run in vain nor toil in vain. You see, he plowed, he, he was a soldier, he planted this vineyard, he, um, 
you know, he shepherded this flock and he's hoping that it's not in vain, that he's going to share in the success of this ecclesia. He's very uh, excited about uh, the, the ecclesia in, oh, you know, the, the, you know the, the, when I say ecclesia in Philippi, it could be many as networked as one, because that's usually how it works. Uh, just like in Jerusalem, there were, there were many ecclesia that were, and they were called the, the ecclesia of Jerusalem. Okay, they're all networked in. Um, but uh, he is going to glory in the success of the ecclesia at Philippi. Okay, because he has a stake in it. He has a stake in their success. So if they succeed, he succeeds. This is the same idea. You're plowing with hope. You're, you're, uh, you're, you're, you're soldiering with, with, with the expectation that you're going to share in the, in the, uh, in, in whatever is the, uh, um, uh, what do you, what do you call it? The spoils of war, right? And, and, uh, and you, and you plant, you plant this vineyard to share the fruit, you shepherd to share the milk and the, and the flock. So it's all about this idea of having a stake in, in, in this project where he sows this, uh, these, these seeds of spiritual things in them. And so, and, and, but if they fail, if he fail, then he feels like he ran in vain or toiled in vain. It's like um, when, when God sets up an ecclesia, he works too. And when the whole thing falls apart, it's all in vain, you know? And, and this idea of the, the, the kingdom that he set up in the kingdom of Israel, and then the hedges fell down and it all got torn up and it's just all, all in vain. It wasn't eternal. So this is what he's, wor he's hoping will happen in Philippi. He's working. Now, he's going to get other rewards for other things and stuff like that, but I think there's a special reward for this idea of setting up a vineyard and it succeeds and it perseveres to the end. You know, it's a, it's it's you've got a stake in that success, okay? Um, okay, so now, okay, also in, well, why don't I just do this? Uh, where am I, Phil? Okay, Phil, okay. So in 4.1, he says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, whom I long to see, uh, 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 my beloved brethren, whom I long to see, my joy and crown, in this way stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. Notice he calls him my joy and crown. My joy and crown. And this is idea, stand firm, persevere, because that I have a stake in it. I have a stake in your success. You're my joy. You're my crown. Okay, stand firm, my beloved. That's, you know, this idea where you have a stake in it. And every member of the Ecclesia of God has a stake in the success of the Ecclesia, by the way. You know, you have a stake in it. You, you've got something to gain if the Ecclesia perseveres to the end. Okay, just, just remember that. Um, now, ro last thing I want to look at is Romans 15. Um, okay, I just want to see where we are. Okay, so Romans 15. Um, here we go. Okay, so Romans 15, 16 through 19, he says this. Okay. Uh, well, maybe I should, but I have written very boldly to you He's talking to the Christians uh, or, you know, the, the, the believers in Rome. I, I've written very boldly to you on some points so as to remind you again, because of the grace that was given to me from God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles, ministering as a priest, uh, ministering as a priest. Oh, I'm sorry. Ministering as a priest. Uh, to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles, ministering as a priest. The now, wait a minute. I'm sorry. Ministering as a priest, the gospel of God. Okay. So that my offering of the Gentiles may become acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. So it's this idea that this offering of the Gentiles he's talking about, this has, and he's going to talk about it in Romans 12, 1, uh, or he already did talk about it in Romans 12, 1, because this is Romans 15, right? So, um, this offering of the Gentiles is this idea where the bodies uh, uh, present, they present their bodies as a living, as, as a life-giving sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, it says in, in Romans 12.1. Um, 
where is Romans? Okay. Uh, let me, it, it's a, right. I urge you brethren by the mercies of God to present your bodies, a, a life giving and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Okay. We've, I think we've gone over that before uh, in other episodes, but it's a really key, key verse because um, it, it really demonstrates the initiation of an ecclesia of God, how, how it's initiated, how the sacrifice is offered. Okay. Uh, it has to be holy and acceptable. Okay. So he says that my offering, and he considers it his offering because he's the one that prepared these Gentiles. He's the one that prepared these hearts when he, when he goes around and he plants these vineyards. He's the one that, that, that proclaims this gospel of the, of the kingdom of God. So it's like his offering of the Gentiles may become acceptable and sanctified by the Holy Spirit. So he wants this offering to become inaugurated. He wants God to accept this, this offering and, 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 and inaugurate it uh, by God to, to, to that that God will take ownership of this gathering of Gentiles and it's sanctified by the Holy Spirit where the Holy Spirit dwells in that gathering and it's set apart from the world and sanctified, you see. So this is what, this is his goal, to be a minister, ministry as a priest of the gospel of God so that my offering um of the Gentiles may become acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, in, in Christ Jesus, I have found reason for boasting in things pertaining to God, for I will, not, um, I will not presume to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me, resulting in the obedience of the Gentiles by word and deed, which, is, which means he's planting and he's, uh, he, he's, he's, he's planting the kingdom of God Obedience of the Gentile by word and deed, but planning a kingdom of God under the law of Christ, okay, in the power of signs and wonders and in the power of the Spirit. All of that um, is, is accomplished through Paul. Paul is the one that initiates it. He's the one that goes in there like a soldier. He's the one that, that proclaims the gospel of the kingdom of God. He's the one that plants this vineyard that, 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 that establishes this kingdom of God in, in you know, this little oasis, this ecclesia of God. Um, he does all this stuff uh, in the power of signs and wonders. It's inaugurated in the power of signs and wonders, the power of the Spirit. So that from Jerusalem and, uh, and round about as far as, uh, I don't know what that, Lycrium, I have fully, fully preached the gospel of Christ. That's what it means to fully preach the gospel of Christ. It's when a kingdom of God is established. That's what, that's what it means to make disciples. When, when, the, when these, these, these converts that are, are attracted to your message of the kingdom of God, the, this gospel of the kingdom of God, they become established by, by what? By obedience and faith by word and deed, okay? They become obedient to the law of Christ and they have faith in this message and they embrace it, all right? So that the, so that the offering of the Gentiles are acceptable and sanctified by the Holy Spirit. That's what Christ, that's what, that's what Paul boasts in because he has a stake in it. So this, this is his glory. This, this is what he's talking about. He has a stake in planting these vineyards, in plowing these fields, in, in preparing this stuff, and shepherding. He has a stake in all of this, and that's where his boast is. That's, that's what he can say, this is what I've done. God has used me to do this. Okay? And, and, and what does this all this mean? Um, it's proof that he's fully preached the gospel of Christ when all this happens. That's what the full gospel of the kingdom of God looks like right there. And if you, if you understand these words and, and you, make, you can make sense that you understand what he's saying. It's, it's the whole idea from conversion all the way to establish the kingdom of God through an ecclesia of God and then shepherding them to understand what their objectives are and to, and to behave in obedience to the law of Christ and to become unified in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God coming together as one. That's, that's the whole idea. That's his goal. That's his objective. That's what he wants to accomplish. That's what it means to seek first the kingdom of God. This, this is all, I hope, you're, you know, I hope you can see the big picture here. Um, 
And so that's why he's always he's trying to preach the gospel where, where it hasn't been preached before, because he wants to start from square one and go through the whole process. And the whole process results, if it's, everything goes successfully and everything goes well, a whole process is going to result in the establishment of the kingdom of God. That's, that's the point. It's got to be an offering of Gentiles that's acceptable to God and sanctified by the Holy Spirit. That's the kingdom of God. That's an ecclesia of God, which is, which is a new covenant kingdom of God. That's what it is. We're a designated people of God. We're a new covenant temple of God. All of it. And, and service by king priests. It, it all comes together. Okay. So anyway, um, all right. So I, I think I'm going to, um, I, I'm just trying to look and see what, what I want to, I want to stop. But, uh, so I think I've already talked about that idea of the sowing the spiritual things. And, and th these are, these are major spiritual things. He has a stake in it and they, they have eternal rewards having, you know, getting, expecting some, you know, m some free room and board isn't that much to ask, right? Um, so, so let, let me just, let me just say uh, one, one last thing. Uh, he says all this stuff about the, the oxen, it was, we, we sowed spiritual things in you. So he says, if others share the right over you, do we not more? In other words, he's the father of the ecclesia. He's kind of the father of the ecclesia. So if others like Peter and 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 some of the brothers of, of Christ come along and, and they say, you know, and they, they get free room and board, wouldn't you think that I was entitled to it too? I mean, you know, that's just a, you know, just a, a comment of, of, you know, what, what makes sense to you, what makes, what seems fair to you. Uh, and nevertheless, he says, nevertheless, we did not use this right. Now that he's established that he, he by a hundred different ways, that he's entitled to free room and board. Okay. But he says, I didn't use it. You see? So all you people that think that I'm not, I wasn't serious when I said I would refrain from meat for the rest of my life, if that was going to cause a stumbling uh, to, to my brother. You don't think I'm serious? What do you think I just did? Uh, you, I, didn't you see right before your eyes? Didn't you even notice? I didn't, I didn't exercise that right for free room and board, and I was there for a year and a half or more. That's a long time. That's a lot of free room and board, right? But he didn't exercise it. He refused it. I'm sure it was offered, but he refused it. Okay? And, and I didn't exercise that right, even though we had it, as I just proved to you in spades. But why? Why didn't you exercise it, Paul? But we endure all things so that we will cause no hindrance to the gospel of Christ. You see? You're whining about a little meat in an idol temple that you have to refrain from that so that you don't cause an hindrance, that you don't cause someone to stumble. I just said no to a, at least a year and a half of free room and board right in front of you. And by the way, I do that everywhere, right? But we don't use that right. We didn't use that right with you. We don't use it right with anybody. But we didn't, we didn't use that right because we endure this stuff. We go ahead and work, which is a lot more effort than just not going to an idol's temple, by the way, by getting your meat elsewhere. Okay. We, we actually worked to pay for our rent, to pay for our food, to pay for our necessities. If we needed new clothes, we paid for it. Okay, we did all that. We endure all things. We endure all things so that we don't cause any hindrance to the gospel of Christ. So don't think that I'm blustering when I say that I will never eat meat if it, if it causes my brother to stumble. If you're going to analyze me, if you're, if you're going to uh, examine me, 
understand. This is my response to you. Now, what do you have to say? You know what I'm saying? That, that's, that's what Paul's saying. That's what Paul's doing right there. He's th he does all this stuff. So just because he doesn't want to cause a hindrance. Because, he, look, it, it's just, it just gives, I mean, it's not to say that uh, everyone that did that was causing a hindrance. He's just saying in the event that it might cause a hindrance. Oh, he's just doing that. He, look, he got free room and board, didn't he? Oh, he stayed a year and a half and got free room and board. Oh, I see. So that's why he's doing all that stuff. That's why he's preaching all that stuff. You know, that's why he's giving you, you know, training you and all that kind of stuff. He's getting free room and board. You see, it just gives Satan one more argument, even though it's a dumb one, but it doesn't matter if it causes just one person to stumble, it causes one person to think or doubt, then Paul says, I don't want any part of it. I'll just, I'll just, I'll provide for myself. Now you have nothing to say. Now you can't say I'm doing this for an ulterior, ulterior motive. I'm doing all this so I can get free room and board. You can't say that. Okay, because I didn't take it. Even though I was entitled to it. I didn't take it. Just to delete that, that issue, uh, put take that issue off the table. You can't use that against me. Even if you did, it would, it would be a, a lousy thing to do. But you, you can't use that against me. That issue is off the table, okay? Because I didn't take it. So, so anyway, that's, that's what, you know, this is kind of his response. Now, this next, you know, this, this next thing here is, I, you know, it's kind of a throw in. It's, oh, I forgot another argument. <laughs> I mean, I don't know what else to say because he's already made all the arguments. He's already made his point. But he says, do you not know that those who perform sacred services eat the food of the temple? Okay, he's making another argument about the Old Covenant and how things worked. Those who attended regularly to the altar had their share from the altar. Okay? So he's, he's making another argument. Oh, by the way, I forgot about this argument. Let me, let me, let me add this one. Um, and by the way, notice this. And this is very interesting. I, I think, I think he, said he, I, he had to put this in here because first of all, Notice how, again, this is something that he was doing. He's not just pulling something out of the air. He was actually performing sacred services by, by, by arranging or, or training these priests, these king priests in, the, in this new covenant temple of God. He was training them, okay? So he was performing sacred services, and he was entitled to participate in the food of the temple in the same way. Okay, and those who attend regularly to the altar had their share of the altar. So this is not, uh, he's not making this up as something that, that, that wasn't happening. This is the new covenant temple of God. Okay, this is the new covenant temple of God. And he was providing services, sacred services to this new covenant temple of God. So th again, this is another confirmation about what he thought of the gathering of the ecclesy of God. This is what it meant. You see what I'm saying? It's all consistent. And then it says, so also the Lord directed those who proclaim the gospel to get their living from the gospel. Finally, he brings up the Lord's command in Matthew 10.10. 10. Did we already look at that? I don't remember. Uh, I think we did, yeah. Um, about how that they are entitled to free room and board as they go from city to city. He finally brings that up. But notice how he links it. Look. I mean, here, here, he links the command of Christ with this illustration of the, of the temple. This illustration of the temple, which we all know, the new covenant temple of God is, is the ecclesia of God. Notice this link here. Very important. Very important that he links this together. Why is it, why is it important? Um, because, because uh, okay, so he says this. So also the Lord directed those who proclaim the gospel, okay, to get their living from the gospel. See, there's a link here. So proclaim the gospel to get their living. Now, living is, is, is Mr. It's, it's, it's not a great translation, okay? 
It, it means to get their necessities from the gospel. It's really, it, really what they need to eat, drink, you know, to survive. The, you know the necessities what they need it's not like they're li not not like what we think of as making a living that's not really exactly what what's being said here but in other words you should get your food you could get your your room and board from the gospel from out of the gospel right um but notice how he's linking the idea of 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 performing sacred services of the food of the temple to this command of Christ that we've already looked at that you could go ahead and get your room and board from a, a home that's in the city. Now, what, why is that? Why is that important? Because notice that the gospel, uh, those who proclaim the gospel, we know, we all know what that means—the gospel of the kingdom of God. To get their living from the gospel, so he's linking this temple with the gospel. He's he's linking this 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 idea of a temple of an old covenant temple with the gospel of the kingdom of God. So when you're proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom of God, it should involve an ecclesia of God, the new covenant temple of God. You see, that's why the link exists. The gospel of the kingdom of God includes all of the instruction and the planting of a vineyard and all of that of an ecclesia of God. Now, in, in Jesus' day, they didn't know how to do that. They couldn't deliver the full gospel of the kingdom of God in Jesus' day. I mean, in you know the the, the disciples that were being uh, being sent out by Jesus during his ministry, they didn't understand the full gospel of the kingdom of God. They just knew the kingdom of God was at hand. They knew the, the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God came near to you. You see, they were given hints, but they didn't understand the whole idea. And that, but the new covenant wasn't initiated yet. It wasn't even initiated yet, but there were hints of it. There was talk about it. The kingdom of God is coming near. Remember? Okay. They do miracles. They heal. They do that kind of. The kingdom of God's coming near. The kingdom of God just came near to you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Just so you know, now we got to go tell someone else this, this new thing is happening. So what Paul is saying, this is the new thing that's hap that's happened. That this is what this is what Jesus was referring to when he said the kingdom of God is at hand, the kingdom of God has come near. This is what he was referring to, this ecclesia of God. That is the new covenant kingdom of God on earth. You see, it all see how it all relates and all how it all connects? Okay, this is what Jesus was talking about. This see, this is what Paul is saying, that's why he connects this whole idea of the temple, of performing sacred service, the temple and, 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 and the altar and all this kind of stuff to this, to this command of Christ. So also the Lord directed those who proclaim this gospel of the kingdom of God to get their necessities from the gospel of the kingdom of God. They say the temple and the gospel of the kingdom of God linked together. And what's the translation of the Old Covenant Temple? It's the New Covenant Temple of God, the Ecclesia of God. So the, the Ecclesia, the New Covenant Ecclesia of God is connected to the gospel of the kingdom of God. That's the connection. That's why they say the kingdom of God. Can... So if you're preaching the gospel without talking about the Ecclesia of God, you're not preaching the full gospel of the kingdom of God. Do you see? You're not talk, you're not preaching the gospel that Jesus wanted you to preach. What he was referring to, but yet was not quite ready yet. It wasn't quite ready yet. The new covenant had yet to be initiated. He had yet to go to the heavenly tabernacle, bring bring his blood. All of that had yet to be done. But he was referring to it. He was he was giving lots of clues and signs that this is what is coming. And so if you're not preaching the full gospel of the kingdom of God as Paul preached it, in, involving the ecclesia of God, as we have talked about it over and over, this new covenant kingdom of God, if you're not doing that, you're not preaching the full gospel of the kingdom of God. You see? That's what's happening here. That's what he's saying. All right, this is just another indication support for this entire video series. It's just another pillar. Another proof that this is what, that this is all true, that this is all real. 
okay? All right, so that's where I'm going to end it, all right? I don't even know how long I've gone. I know I've gone maybe even two and a half, but um, anyway, um, so where where am I? Nope, I'm right, okay. <laughs> I was going to the wrong place. Okay, so anyway, uh, that's just so important. That's so key. That's so, you know, meditate on it. Think about it, you know, see this stuff. When you're reading, you should be able to see this stuff now. You should be able to know and recognize it and, and say, oh, wow, that's interesting how it connects like that. It, 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 it's just connected right there. It's just beautiful, beautiful how the gospel, the kingdom of God, how Jesus was referring to it. It had yet to be completely established, had yet to, you know, it was, but it was at hand. It was close. It was coming. And now Paul's saying, it's here. It's here. And this is it. This ecclesia of God, that's it. You see? So this, this is how Paul taught the gospel of the kingdom of God. So we, there's more and more proof. You see it everywhere. The more you understand it, the more you, you see it everywhere. It's all there. You just didn't know how to read the scriptures before. We didn't know how to see it before. We didn't know how to understand the scriptures because we were missing this huge piece of what it of what an ecclesia of God is. Once you have that piece, all of this stuff just fits together. It's beautiful. It's just gorgeous. It's just incredible once you see it. Okay? So anyway, um, uh, there you go. Next uh, next episode, we'll start talking about... Well, I'm going to go through some things first uh, about how, what the church system does to some of this stuff and how they skew everything and mess everything up to try to support their own vision or their own design, man's design. But anyway, uh, I hope that this, this really helps you. If you have any questions, just let me know. But this is just really important. This is so key. This is such a, a huge uh, insight if you can see it. It's very important to see. And uh, I thank you for, for, you know, for, again, continuing on this journey. Uh, we're at, what, what is this, 58 right now? Uh, and we're just, we're just forging ahead, <laughs> okay? And there's so much more to see. There's so much more to see. So anyway, uh, but until the next episode, Thank you for watching.